Good morning, good morning, good morning. How's everybody today? A lot better now, right? Man, we're so glad to have all of you here at Connections Church this beautiful Sunday. Uh, man, hard to believe Thanksgiving is this week. How many of you feel like you've blinked your eyes and this uh, year has just flown by? Hard, hard to even comprehend that we're about to uh, turn into 2022 in just a, a, a little over a month. It's, it's crazy, but this week is Thanksgiving week, and, and I just had a little little poll I want to take. How many of you are, are turkey people? You just love love some good old turkey, and, and, and you're going to be having some turkey this Thursday and maybe Friday and Saturday and, you know, Sunday and uh, leftovers just keep coming, it seems like, with turkey. It's like the, the miracle bread. It just multiplies. But how many of you are ham people? You, you like a good good ham? Yeah, there, there you go. Well, well let, me, let me just put this out there. How many of you say you can keep the turkey and the ham? Give me the sides. I want the, the stuffing, the mashed potatoes, the gravy, and, and all that good stuff. Let's see those hands up loud and proud. Yeah. Now, this is the real important test. How many of you are like me and say you can keep the turkey, you can keep the ham, keep the sides? Bring me the desserts, right? I mean, come on, church. Let me hear you say something. Get those sweets rolling. I mean, I love a good dessert. So I think we're all going to be blessed this week and have our options and choices and, and plenty because we are blessed, right? Now, this is interactive. you got to got to work with me here. Don't, don't sit on your hands and be quiet. Turn to somebody and say, we are truly blessed. Go ahead. They need to hear that, not just from me, but from you also. So we're in the third week of a series called I Quit. How many of you ever quit something before? You just said, that's it, I've had enough. So we've been talking about things that are really good to quit, not, not things that, that we, we shouldn't be quitting. And today we're going to move our attention to this very important thing called complaining. Anybody ever been guilty of that? All right, raise them all up or you might need to come down the altar and repent for a lion this morning. We live in a culture that is very discontented, it seems. Complaining happens every time there is a line. How many of you hate to stand in line? I refuse to go to Disney for that purpose. Well, not just for that purpose, because they rip you off financially, too. They want to charge you $1,000 just for even walking in the park, it seems like. So, so we hate to stand in line. What about a traffic jam? How many of you fight traffic every morning on your way to work, and woo, it, it causes you to think some unpleasant things sometimes, right? Traffic is, is horrible, especially around this area of Charlotte, North Carolina. What about cold weather? You ever complain about cold weather or hot weather or, or you know, rainy weather? I don't like, like rainy days and stuff. What about bad service at the restaurant? I try not to complain about that because that's a tough job, right? Let's, let's hand it to our servers. They, they got a tough job, and, and we, we, but we, we tend to do that. When, it, when it's Monday, how many of you hate seeing Mondays come and you're dreading it already? Boy, we got one right here. It's like, yeah, man, I can't stand Mondays. I'd like to take Monday and just choke it. Okay, calm down, calm down. What about, I don't know, waking up too early, right? What about this one? Our, our kids, they love to complain about this. Mommy, I can't connect to the Wi-Fi. You know what I'm talking about? I mean, that's like the center of their world is, is getting online to play their games or whatever it is they're all about. So, so wait, wait a minute. Here's a good one. And, and, and all you married folks will understand. There's some moms with sons. What about complaining about the, the boys, the men in the house? Don't raise the lid. Now, that's all I'm going to say. But you know what I'm talking about. When the, when the lid isn't raised in a certain part of the house, it can cause some complaints to come forward. Now, we talk about the culture that we live in, the world around us, and they're complaining. But the truth is that we tend to participate in it also. It doesn't just happen in the culture, but sadly, also way too many times in the church. You don't believe me? Well, let me just share a couple. There's complaining about the preaching, as we uh, say here in the South. It's too long. My goodness, we, we let the Baptist beat us down at the, at the Golden Corral and get in line first, and we had to wait a little longer. I mean, you know? Now, very few people, but this is always refreshing, will complain when we don't preach long enough. Wow, what a dream come true. It doesn't happen often. Sometimes people say, Pastor, we just we could have went all day just, just hearing those great words of, of encouragement from God's Word from you. Now, again, it doesn't happen very often. And when it does happen, it's like, whoa, oh, about passed out because you just said that. So, so we complain about, you know, the preaching. Maybe it's the service, the way it went or didn't go. We felt like this song should have been done, not whatever. Maybe we, we complain about the volume. You're getting awful quiet on me now. 
oh, it was way too loud. Or those people that have a little trouble hearing were like, I can't hear. Can you hear? I, I can't hear what they're saying. So the volume, and this is always a good one that's always seemingly coming up, and that is the temperature. Some people are too hot. Some people are too cold. When we get in here on a morning like this morning where it's cold at night and, and there's a chill in the room, we, we try to turn a little bit of heat on because once all you people come flooding in, your body heat is going to magnify things and we all join together. And then the next thing you know, it goes from like 63 to like 93 and just a heartbeat and like we can't get it cooled down quick enough to get people right. And people, believe it or not, have complained about that before. I'm too hot or I'm too cold. How many of you grew up in an old church that used to have blankets? <laughs> Or shawls, the ladies group would knit shawls, you know, I don't even know if people knit anymore, but there'd be shawls spread out. So if you were a little chilly, you just grab a shawl. Don't complain about it. Just wrap yourself up in one of those brightly colored shawls and, and get a little bit warmed up. Or better yet, if you grew up in a Pentecostal church, you didn't need a shawl. You just take off running and a lap or two and like, woohoo, man, yes, I'm feeling better already. I'm getting a little bit warmed up. We have a tendency to complain about a lot of different things. As a matter of fact, some recent research reveals that the average person, now I like to think, I'm going to stop right here, I like to think we're above average here. <laughs> you people are awesome, you're incredible, right? That first group in here this morning at 9 o'clock, they were a little on the borderline, but you guys, I'm telling you, y'all are, y'all are sharp, I'm, you're something. Turn around and tell your neighbor how good they look today, go ahead. Just, just compliment somebody. But the average person, which we, I, I believe, are above average for sure, Complains between 15 to 30 times a day. 15 to 30 times a day, the average person is lodging some kind of complaint from their mouth. Now, you may be like me and know a few people that it seems to be 15 to 30 times an hour they're, they're doing that, right? It's like it's a constant stream of complaint, which is, which is sad. And the oddity of this about living in such an unhappy culture is that materialistically we have more than we've ever had before, yet we still seem to be so discontent and even more discontent than those who have gone before us. And I believe I know one of the major reasons why that is, and if you'll bear with me, I want to share that with you, is because the world around us in which we live in, especially as Americans, constantly tells us that we will not be happy unless we get one thing. And if you're taking notes, write this down. The one thing that they're always beating the drum for that we've got to have that's going to make us happy, that's going to fill that emptiness in our hearts and, and cause us to go from being someone who complains to being someone who is joyful, that one thing is more. Simply more. More stuff. More friends. More popularity. More better clothing. More better Housing, more, more better cars. I mean, it's just more, more, more seems to be the drumbeat all around us. And if we can get more, then we won't be complaining. And what this does, church, is it leads to a never-ending pursuit of the next thing that will never leave us satisfied. You ever, you ever notice that? Never leave us satisfied. This is why the, the main text today is so important, and it's found in Paul's book to the church at Philippi, Philippians chapter 2, verse 14. Very simple opening statement in this verse, but very powerful. And if we can get a hold of this, it can change our lives. So bear with me as I read it, and it's probably going to be on the screen here in just a moment because our production team is all over things, and then maybe not this morning in this service. They were the first service. Oh, there it is, Philippians 2, 14. Just, just check that out. Do all things. How many things? Everything, all things, without murmurings or disputings. In other words, do everything that you do without complaining or arguing, without conflict, without complaint. Do everything without that. Don't you love that? Now, truth of the matter is, we come from a very long line of complainers. Uh, case in point, the very first complainer on this planet was a man by the name of Adam. Anybody remember him? Maybe you ran into him a time or two. I don't know. I hope you're not that old. If so, man, this is weird, but uh, okay. But Adam, if you will remember correctly, the very first complaint that he lodged after he and his wife Eve ate of the fruit they were not supposed to eat of, what did he do? He spoke to God and said, this woman... <laughs> 
Now, how many of you husbands have used that tone and, and said those words before? You're talking to somebody, a family member, a friend. You're not going to believe what this woman has done now. You know, kind of along those lines. Careful with that. Because Adam wanted to blame his wife. He said, Lord, if it weren't for this woman, I would not have eaten of the fruit that you said to stay away from. The woman that you gave me. She gave me of the tree and I did eat. Woo! We're going to get into that in just a few moments, how, how that goes. Another Big complainer was his son Cain. It kind of goes down through the, the bloodline, it seems like, in Genesis 4, 13. And Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is greater than I can bear. And what he had just done is murdered his brother, and God caught him on it and punished him for it, right? Rightfully so. And Cain's complaining about being punished for murder. How sad that is. Moses complained about God's timeline for saving the children of Israel. You remember Moses, the great leader of, of the people to freedom out of Egyptian bondage. And God said, Moses, you're going you're gonna to lead my people out from Pharaoh's control. And they're going to go to the, to the promised land. And I'm going to establish you guys and bless you guys. And you're going to be free people. You remember that story? And Moses took the challenge reluctantly. He tried to use every excuse in the book. We talked about that last week. Stop the excuses or two weeks ago. Quit, quit making excuses. And, 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 and in the end, Moses said, yes, sir, God, whatever you want to do. And he started to march them out. But the timeline wasn't going according to what Moses had in mind. How many of you have dealt with that? I, I, I know in my heart because God makes promises. God speaks dreams and visions and, and, and plants those plans in our hearts, right? Because he loves us. Just like he told Jeremiah, I have great plans for you even before you in your mother's womb. I knew you. And so many times we, we get that from the Lord when we're walking with him in, in close relationship and prayer and, and, and reading his word and studying and following him as a disciple, a learner of Jesus Christ. And God will speak something to us. God birthed this church in my heart about 15 years ago. Nothing was here. There wasn't a Connections Church. There wasn't anything like this. We didn't have this building here. This property didn't belong to us. It still belonged to Moose Lodge. But yet God said, I'm going to establish a church. You are going to plant a church, and I am going to bless that church. And I got that, that dream and that, that word from God, and I held on to it. And I'm going to tell you, there was times we were marching through the, the wilderness, it seemed, as we were going from place to place. We were at a warehouse on Main Street. We were at a restaurant to start with. We, we, we were sharing facilities with an older church in town. And man, they were not always easy times. And the timeline of God giving us our own location with our own land and, and our own facilities where we could do everything that God put on our heart to do. See, what many of you do not know is that right now there's a team of folks that's been working for a couple of weeks now that go out every Sunday to feed homeless people. And, and today they are feeding them a big Thanksgiving meal and they've been cooking all week and preparing. And they've been back in our kitchen as we have services this morning getting all the stuff together to take to the streets to feed the displaced roses that we are out there ministering to every week. We didn't have a place like that before. And many times we get anxious, and many times we, we want it now, and we're, 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 we're not very, you ever notice we're not very patient people? But God says, wait on me, and Moses was struggling with that. He was like, God, I, I, I'm, I'm tired, we, we need to get there, we need it, need it to happen now. And you think Moses was complaining, the children of Israel that he was leading, I'm talking millions of people, were also getting frustrated and complaining. And they were, it felt like they were in the wilderness and they didn't have enough to drink and they didn't have enough to eat. How many of you get cranky? I mean, you get hangry when you're hungry, right? And when you're thirsty, something inside of you craves. You've got to have that because that's the nourishment of life. And so something cries out for me. I got to have some food and I got to have something to drink. And then the longer it goes, the more irritable you become. I know that's hard to believe with you people because you are precious and gentle and loving and just amazing. But at times we do get frustrated. And they begin to lash out. And they begin to lodge their complaints at Moses, of course, right? Saying things like this. It would be better if we would have just died in, the, in, the, in Egypt there and never come out to the wilderness here. It would have been better if we had just never had this promise before us. Why, why are we hungry? Why are we thirsty? What's going on? And then you remember God miraculously started feeding them manna from heaven. You, you remember that story? I mean, they wake up, there'd be a fresh supply of bread on the ground every morning. They were to gather up and eat for that day. You can't hold any of it over. It's not going to last till the next day because the next day God's going to provide more. 
And man, what a blessing that was. But it's funny, as we all are as human beings, the gratitude of that didn't last very long. Because it came to a point where they was like, is this it? Every day, manna? Really? What about some variety? How many of you are leftover people? That turkey that you're going to have on Thursday and Friday and Saturday and next week a few days, and then they'll turn into turkey stew and, you know, after the turkey sandwiches and all. And then when finally that 40-pound turkey is all gone, like, you know, right before Christmas, you'll be like, I am. I'm preaching it. I am not a big left. I can eat leftovers one time maybe after you have it, and then that's it. I want variety. I kind of relate to the children of Israel here. How many of, of us do that? That we get discontent quickly with, with what God is providing, and how dare we do that, but yet we, we do. And, and they begin to grumble and complain and murmur and come against Moses and say, why is this happening? That's a part of our lineage. That's... that's Stuff that's been kind of passed down to us. So, so look at me for just a moment, uh, if you haven't already. I know I'm not the best thing to look at, but we tend to get caught up in, in those patterns of life. Grumbling and complaining and being discontent and why me and why, why hasn't this happened already and, and the timing of things and, and impatience and, and, and just, just all of it can bring us to a place where we struggle. Numbers 11 verse 1 says, And when the people complained, it displeased the Lord, and the Lord heard it, and his anger was kindled. Two lessons that we want to take away here. The first one is simply that God hears our complaining. He hears it. In Exodus 16, 12, the first few words of that, God says to Moses these words, I have heard the murmurings of the children of Israel. I am here. I am attentive. What that tells me is that God, who created the heavens and the earth and all that's in it, right? And I believe that just as sure as I'm standing here, that God in heaven, with all the vast amounts of people on this planet at this current time, and more being added every moment, and more leaving this planet every moment, and yet God in his infinite wisdom and power says, I know what's going on. You think I don't. Many times you don't even think about thinking I do or don't. You just get caught up in life. But here's the reality of it. I know everything that's happening. I know even the very thought and intent of your heart, the Bible tells us, is what God is saying. So here's what he says right here. I hear the murmuring of your people. I am attentive to that. I know what's going on. When they exalt me and praise me and thank me for getting them out of Egyptian bondage, I hear that. And that delights my heart. But when they complain and gripe and murmur against you and me, I hear that. That same lesson applies to us here in November of 2021 in America, in Belmont, here at Connections Church. God hears. He hears our complaints. Lesson number two from this little, this little snippet is that God is the ultimate object of our complaining. In verse 8 of, of chapter 16 of Exodus, Moses said, This shall be when the Lord shall give you in the evening flesh to eat and the morning bread to be full, for that the Lord hears your murmurings which you murmur against him. It's God that's the target of this complaint. See, many of the people thought we're going to go to Moses and just gripe to him and complain about him. Why did you do this, Moses? You know this is all your fault. If you had just left us in Egypt... At least we'd still be there working away for nothing for the man, for Pharaoh. But we would have a place. We would have a little bit of food. But here's the thing about it. How often are we ready to trade in our freedom for a little bit of food for the moment? And so they think they're complaining to Moses, about Moses. But ultimately the lesson here for all of us to learn is that when we lodge a complaint like this, what's really going on is we're complaining to God about God. And that's a, that's a heavy thing. That is what we should not be doing. Now back to our original text that we read a few moments ago, Philippians 2.14. Do all things without murmuring and disputing. I want you to know the Greek word translated murmuring speaks to mumbling frustrations under your breath. <laughs> 
you're like, oh, how, how does that play out? I'll tell you how it plays out. I'm glad you asked that question. That's a good question. How many of you have children? You ever notice when you're raising your children and you're at home and you come in from, from work after a long day and you're tired and the expectation of feeding everybody is just on your shoulders. You got to come up with the dinner, right? And you walk in and you notice those list of chores, a small list. Just take the trash out, clean up your room. Just a few things you've asked the kids to do. You walk in from work, it's not done. Now, when I was growing up, we'd have a come to Jesus meeting. And I still think that's a great way to handle business as parents. So you call little Johnny and Susie down and say, guys, listen, what, what's the deal? I told you guys, I, I put the list out. I gave you some incentives. That's the way we parent today. You'll get so many hours on your gaming system. You'll get so many hours to do this and, and, and all this stuff, and yet you didn't do the chores, and why is it not done? And you're getting a little excited and elevated, and, and they're not really happy to hear that, or, or they, they're in a mood or whatever, and so they, they look at you, and they start going, you're like, excuse me? Did, did you say something? And it's always this. No. You're hearing the wind rustle or blowing the trees outside something. It wasn't me, I promise. When you and I, we're not idiots, right? I don't think, ask your neighbor, are you an idiot? It should be an answer of resoundingly no, okay. So we're not idiots, we know what's going on. And that makes us kind of blood boil even, even a little bit more, right? But you, you don't talk back to me. And that's kind of how this murmuring thing plays out, that we're discontent, we're upset, we're frustrated. So what we're going to do is just gonna, we're not going to outright say, God, why? I'm upset about this. This didn't happen in my time in the way I thought it would. So, so this is your fault. We don't do that typically. We just kind of like, too much, too much, too much. And that's what Paul is stressing. Don't do that. The word disputing implies a mental response. It speaks to questioning and doubting. I'm disputing what's going on here, God. I, 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 I'm, I'm full of doubt. I'm questioning. I don't understand. It's, it's easy to look at these, these, these words in, in just a, a limited little piece by itself. But, but there's a greater context here because... As we, as we see in verses 12 and 13, it tells us to work it on salvation with fear and trembling. We're not saved by good works, but to do good works. The best word that speaks to our living out our salvation is this one word. When it comes to the things of God, this is the thing that God calls us to. And if you're taking notes, write it down. It's this word called obedience. Lord, I don't understand everything. Because you know what? We, we, we as Christians, we go through some stuff, right? I mean, when you say yes to Jesus, life doesn't just get peachy and hunky-dory and zippity doo dah and there's no problems anymore, and you're just walking on sunshine. No, it's not always walking on sunshine. Sometimes you're walking through the valley. Sometimes, as the Bible says, all hell is coming at you. And, and our, our response, the, the, the natural, normal response is, I want to avoid that. I want to get out of there. I want to, I want to head for higher ground and, and, and brighter days. And, and, Lord, I don't want to go through these tough times. But the reality is, is those tough times are what shape us. Those hard trials are what purge us and, 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 and make us draw closer to God and rely on him even more. And, and that's what we've got to understand, that, that smooth seas do not make great sailors, but it's those winds and those waves that are tossing the vessel around. And when you can hold on to Jesus and know that he's going to get you through, that's what it's all about. No matter what you're facing, that you always and I always say, yes, sir, to God, whatever it is he asks of us. And wherever he may lead us. That's what we must come to a place where we can believe that, live that, and be able to make that statement, I will do all things without murmuring and disputing, questioning God, doubting his faithfulness and his character and his nature. So, so listen to me. We're going we're gonna to finish this up real quick by looking at five ways we can quit complaining. But here's, here's the reality of it. I, mean, I can stand up here and talk to you all day. 
I could tag Pastor Scott in when I got so tired I couldn't speak anymore. He could come up here and talk to you all day about the importance of, of not complaining and the importance of, of, of thanking God and always being in, in, in that attitude of gratitude and all that kind of stuff. But guess what? If you don't want that to happen in your life, none of that's going to matter. You talk to, they always say, proverbial blue in the face. It's not going to do anything for you because you've got to want it. As a matter of fact, you've got to want it more than you want that, that fried chicken for lunch today. You've got to want this more. You've got to want to quit complaining. You've got to want to have, have, be transformed into a person who, who is grateful and thankful to God for every blessing that comes your way. So if, 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 if that's the case, you're about ready to have your, your world rocked. How do we quit complaining? First of all, admit the tendency to complain is a problem in our lives. The first thing we have to do is confess it as sin because that's exactly what it is. Listen to me. Proverbs 28, 13 says, A man who refuses to admit his sins can never be successful. Never be blessed. Folks, that, that's the hardest thing for us because when we look in the mirror and see what's looking back at us, we want to believe and think the best. We want to think, man, I've got it all together. I don't have any issues. I don't have any problems. Man, I'm, I'm good. But everybody else around me, that's where the problem's at. If they could all get their stuff straightened out, man, everything would be great. Because it ain't me, as we say here in the South. But you know what? It is us most of the time. None of us are perfect people. And if complaining is a sin in your life that seems to be a regular thing, it's time to quit. Let me ask you this crazy notion. What if someone followed you and you didn't realize it for a whole week and were recording every word that you spoke throughout that week? At the end of that time period, what would they be able to play back? Would it be a lot of, of, of positive things, mostly positive things, mostly encouraging things, mostly things of gratefulness and gratitude, or it would be a lot of complaining and mumber, mumbling and grumbling and all that kind of stuff? I don't know. I'm just asking you to think about that. Admit and confess. Complaining isn't just a bad habit or tendency. It is a sin. It's serious. Second thing we've got to do to quit that is accept responsibility for our own lives. Amen? That would have been a great place to say amen. Amen? Okay. A lot of times complaining is an attempt to blame other people for the problems we create. What we try to do is get the focus off of us and onto somebody else. Proverbs 19.3 says, people ruin their lives by their own foolishness, and then they are angry at the Lord. How many times do we do that? People plead with us and beg us, please don't do this. The decision you're making, the things you're doing, are going to bring hurt and harm to you, your family, those who love you, those who respect you and admire you. And nevertheless, you go, well, thanks, but no thanks. I'm going to do it anyway. And then when we do it and everything crumbles in and falls apart, we're like, God, why? Why me? I don't deserve this. I mean, this is just not fair. You ever heard the old expression, you do the crime, you do the time? I have a feeling God just might be wanting to say that to us. Look, look, I, I, I tried everything that I could to get you not to do that, and yet you just went ahead and did it. We love shifting the blame. Listen, we're free to make a choice, but we're not free from the consequences of the choices in which we make. People complain about being in debt after they spend money after money after money on everything new that they can possibly get to try to keep up with, with the, those people in the neighborhood. People say they're not appreciated at home or at work. Let me ask this question. Are you appreciative of other people around you? Because here's the, the principle in that. We reap what we sow, church. So whatever it is that you want to get in your life, you better sow that seed around you. And it'll come back to you. I've come to realize there are three types of people in life. Accusers. People who always want to say it's your fault. How many of you remember Adam? He was an accuser. Lord, this woman you gave me. Right here. It's her fault. I'm as innocent and pure as the driven snow. Really? There are accusers. There are excusers. How about that? Well, I'm just a product of my environment or my upbringing. I can't help the way I, I was raised and the family. I was, oh, my family tree looks like a pile of weeds. It's just terrible. I mean, you know, so therefore, you know, it is what it is, right? Wrong. 
We, we talked a couple of weeks ago about stop making excuses. Stop making that excuse. My Bible tells me that when we surrender to Jesus Christ, we are a new creation in Christ Jesus. Old things have passed away. And behold, all things. How many? All things are becoming what? New. So throw that excuse out the book. But now I like this third category of people. It's the ones I, I tend to gravitate towards. They're called the choosers. And, and those who are successful and blessed in life always take responsibility for their lives and their choices. I learned a long time ago, especially in leadership, you got to take the blame when it's coming to you. And people respect you more when you step up and say, yep, that one's on me. I, I called that. I thought it was going to work out great. It did not. Guess what? I, I, I'm, I'm the reason why. I'm the one that said, let's go that way. And I am sorry. It, it was a mistake. We messed up. I messed up. I'm the one that did. So, hey, take ownership. Be that person that chooses the right things in life and stand behind those things. Number three, getting rid, of, getting rid of complaining in your lives, develop that attitude of gratitude. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 18, we are told by Paul in his writings through the Holy Spirit to give thanks in how many circumstances? All circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Be thankful in every situation. He didn't say for all situations, but in all situations. How many remember Paul and Silas when they were thrown in prison for preaching the gospel of Christ and beaten before they were thrown in prison? They were down in that, that, that jail cell and just, it, it could have very easily turned to a place of, woe is me, I'm just so, so pitiful. How, we're just out there trying to do good and, and, and all of they do this to us and I, I just, but instead the Bible says at midnight they were singing and praising God. Their backs wide open from the lashes of the whip across them and nevertheless they were worshiping God. And the Bible says that all of a sudden that place that they were in, that jail cell began to shake. And the doors were open wide. Because of their choice in all things to worship God, the Lord delivered them. The Lord saved one of the jailers and his whole family because of their obedience to worship and not complain. Number four, look for God's hand in every circumstance. If you want victory over complaining, always look for the hand of God and whatever's going on in your life. 2 Corinthians 4, 17 and 18 tells us, And these small and temporary troubles we suffer will bring us to a tremendous and eternal glory, much greater than the trouble we face right now. For we fix our attention not on the things that are seen and earthly and temporary, but on the things that are unseen. What can be seen lasts only for a time, but what cannot be seen lasts forever. What a beautiful promise. Paul says that although there are problems that come into our lives, the way that we look at those determines our attitudes. And God is always working for your good and his glory. Every problem is a temporary situation in light of the reality of eternity. But when we complain, we are basically saying that if I were God, I would do this way. Complaining is simply rebellion. Three quick things. When I complain, I'm questioning God's wisdom. I am doubting God's love, and I am forgetting God's goodness in my life. Has he been good to you, church? Is he good to you today, right now? I mean, look at this group. You people are, are clothed well. Looking at you, are fed well. Amen. <laughs> I'm in that group too, guys, I'm telling you. After the holidays, I got to really hit it hard. Should have hit it hard about six months ago, but you know how that goes. It's like, woo -hoo. excuses. Remember that one just a minute, okay? Guys, we are so blessed. We've got to look for God's hand in every situation. When we don't, it's a warning light. When we begin to complain that, that, that we're forgetting the goodness of God. And then the last thing this morning is this. Practice speaking positively. Complaining is a sin and a habit. The only way to stop it is replace it with a good habit. Speaking good things. Ephesians 4, 29 says, Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what's helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen to you. Psalm 34, 1 says, I will bless the Lord. How many times? At all times, and his praise will what? Always be on my lips. If we're always praising God and edifying others, then guess what? You know what that leaves? It leaves no room for griping and complaining and murmuring. Is that not true? You ain't got no time to be doing that when you're worshiping God and blessing other people. I have made it a point in my life here recently. 
And what brought it to my attention was the, the COVID stuff and everything shutting down and restaurants being at Skeleton Cruise and can't find people to work. I have made it a point in my life. I, I feel like the Holy Spirit told me to start going to the managers at restaurants when I go out for lunch or go out for dinner to stop on my way out and say, hey, I, I just want to tell you that, that, that Jane over there that served us today did an amazing job. She was, she was awesome and, and, and everything was great. And, and I, want, I want you to know that because you hear the bad stuff a lot, right? And man, sometimes I've had them well up with tears like, yeah, yeah we, we, we sure do. I said, I want you to hear the good things. And I want to be the one that tells you those good things because, man, she did a bang-up job. And you know what? Sometimes it wasn't even that great of a job. And, and, and I just, but I just want them to know that, that hey, we appreciate you being here and serving because so many are choosing not to. I, and there's amazing things that happen, and, and people will just stop and say, well, what's your name? I mean, who, who are you? Because it's so rare these days, and it should not be that way. As the people of God, we should be the most grateful people on the planet. His praise should always be on our lips, and edifying others should always be coming out of our mouths. We are blessed, as the old saying goes, to be a blessing. Why not do that? As often as we can. If you'll close your eyes just for a moment with me as we prepare to baptize these folks and celebrate what God's doing in, in their lives and our church family. I just want to encourage every one of us before we, we, we make that step to do that. To, to examine your heart with the Holy Spirit doing the, the looking. As we like to say around here. Let him. Let him take a full investigatory look into your heart and your life right now. I believe that many of you were doing that as we were marching through this message today that, that, that God was speaking to you and saying, you know what? You need some help in this area. You need to quit grumbling and complaining and, and murmuring. You, you, you need to stop that. And for some, it's not, not so much to do that. You just don't praise him as, as much. You don't worship him as much. Those who are being baptized, you can go and get ready right now. I, I, sorry I didn't release you there in just, just a moment ago. But go ahead and start preparing and get yourself ready. But, but, but the rest of us who are, who are here, just, just think for a moment. What is it that God needs to do in my life? Listen, we're saved. Most of us in here, if you're not, today is your day of salvation. Accept the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, think about that blessing. His blood shed on Calvary's cross. For us, he took our place. He took our sins upon himself so that we wouldn't have to pay for our own sinfulness. So those of you that are saved, how grateful are you for that? Those of you that aren't, today's your day. I think most of us in this room have a place to lay our heads tonight that is safe and warm and comfortable most of us in this room I believe all of us have a friend or family member who at some point in time today or this week is going to come up and put their arms around us and give us a hug and say man I love you I want you to know that I, I, I love you I'm so thankful that God has placed you in my life so, so think about those big blessings but all the other many blessings that we so easily forget that there's not enough paper in the world for us to even attempt to write them down on we are blessed and so for just a moment if you're in this room and you say pastor you know what the Lord has been speaking to my heart there are some things that I need to allow him to come and change in my in my life and I want to do that right now can I just see your hands all across this room just slip them up and let me know how to pray and who to pray for thank you thank you thank you Thank you, thank you. Yes, yes, yes. I, I, oh, wow, what a blessing. Hands going up everywhere. Any others that would say, hey, don't forget me in this closing prayer of, of this time of our service. I, I want to see God change some things in my life. Just lift your hands up with, with those who already have. Yes, ma'am, yes, ma'am, yes, yes. Here's what I want to ask for just a moment. If, if everybody would stand up. You've been seated for a, a little while. Some of you are going to say, yeah, you preached a little long today, preacher. Or some of you say, well, it wasn't quite long enough. I, I can go for some more. But nevertheless, just stand up and get your legs stretched a little bit. Elbow your neighbor and say, man, it's good to be here with you today. Go ahead. It's okay. And for so many of you that raised a hand today and said, hey, man, I need the Lord to come and transform some things in my life and change some things. I just want to pray over you and for you right now and for Many others who maybe are in the same boat and you didn't raise a hand, would you just, just tell God that right now? Lord, 
come and do a work. And if you're in this room and you need the Lord to, to save you, set you free, and change your life forever, cover and cleanse your sins and remove those and make you into a new creation with every eye closed for just a moment now. If that's your decision today, would you raise your hand and let me know? I just want to know better how to pray for you and what's going on in your life. Thank you. Anybody else? Any others? Yes, thank you. So as we prepare to baptize this, this amazing group of, of folks today that are a part of our church family, I'm going to pray for all of us before they come. Lord, we love you. We are the most blessed people on the face of the earth. God, that you would help us not to see the things we don't have and focus on that, but God, you would help us to focus on all the incredible blessings that you bring into our lives, that life itself. We woke up this morning. We opened our eyes. What a gift that is of another day that you have granted us on this side of heaven. And Lord, this is the declaration we make. We want to make the most of this day. We want to be people who worship you, that your praise is continually on our lips. We want to be people who declare and speak blessing to other people. Regardless of the good or bad situations, we want to trust you and honor you and worship you in every part of our lives. Help us in that, God. Help us not to see the trials and the, the valleys as, as punishment. They're not that at all. But they are shaping us and molding us and helping us remove the stuff in our lives that is not supposed to be there and helping us to grow and mature into strong men and women and people and young people of God. That we are soldiers and you don't train soldiers lightly. They don't go through a powder puff game. They go through the real thing, God. Intense at times. And Lord, thank you for those intense seasons because we know they are for our benefit and for your glory that we will become soldiers. No turning back. No turning back. We carry our cross for you, Jesus Christ. I thank you that you are shaping and molding. You are removing things from our lives today as we offer them up and say, God, take them and good riddance. I don't want them as a part of my life anymore. I don't want to be a complainer. I don't want to be a murmur. I don't want to grumble. I want to be a person of worship and encouragement and blessing. And I choose that this day in my life. And I speak that over my home and my family and my circle of friends and my workplace and my school, God. Let me be the spark that lights the fire in all of these areas. In Jesus' name we pray and all God's people said, amen and amen.